Please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Harry Sharoff. Okay, well, thank you all for coming, and um, uh, thanks for the introduction, and I also wanted to thank the National Academies for uh, bringing me here. It's really a pleasure to tell you a bit about what I work on. Uh, so I'm a microscopist, and what gets me up in the morning is thinking about how to make optical microscopes uh, better, to be able to see small things. And today I'm just going to tell you about one part of my research, which has to do with trying to study how the developing brain um, uh, functions and, and comes together in a very simple organism, this worm. And I'm interested in mapping both how the neurons come together to form a functional brain, but then also signal propagation and calcium flux within a worm embryo as it develops, so sort of how the brain uh, comes online. So before I talk about you know, why I chose the worm and why I'm doing this, just kind of a, to take a step back, um, all of you have about 100 billion neurons, uh, orders of magnitude more synapses, and about 25,000 genes. So somehow, despite that incredibly large parts list, these parts all come together as we grow up in order to form our functioning uh, brains. And how they come together is really not well understood. So it turns out that if you just catalog the genes uh, and look at their function, that's, that's pretty good. It gives you a start. But what you really want is a movie as to how the whole brain comes together, ideally with enough resolution that you can actually see individual neurons and even you know, beneath an individual neuron. But uh, despite the microscope technology that I'm going to tell you about today, that's currently not possible uh, with today's technology. So whenever you have a problem in biology that you want to study but it's intractable, uh, you can go to a model organism. So you can try and study that biology in a simpler context. Uh, and I, I have a lab at the NIH. That's where I did most of the research I'm going to tell you about today. But I spend my summers at Woods Hole in a, a biology laboratory there. I take about half of my lab there. And I was trolling around the library in Woods Hole uh, one day uh, last summer, and I came across this amusing quotation by this guy, Carl Georg Friedrich Rudolf Lukart, the, the so-called father of parasitology. And what Carl said is that it is not, he says, it's not possible for a person as a thinking being to close their mind to the knowledge that they are ruled by the same power as is the animal world. Like the despised worm, they live in dependence upon external commands, and like the worm, they perish even when they have shaken the world through the power of their ideas. So the, the, the key point I want to get across here is that what is true for the worm can be true for the human. Uh, and so we can make things a bit simpler if we try and study how the brain forms in this little, ne this little round worm, the nematode C. elegans. So, uh, so meet the worm. This is a small, transparent worm. It's about the size of a human hair, a really small hair. So it's about the size of a comma at the end of a sentence. It's found uh, everywhere in the world in, uh, in soil or in rotting fruit, and it eats bacteria. So instead of 100 billion neurons, like you and me, a C. elegans has 300 neurons. Instead of uh, hundreds of trillions of synapses, this has only between five and, and 7,000 chemical synapses, and roughly the same number of genes, around uh, 20,000 genes. So, so is it really true you can learn something fundamental by studying this worm? And um, before I get into sort of the brain of the worm, I just want to take a step back and tell you about another fundamental process that was sort of discovered in this particular worm. And for that, we have to go back um, to the early 1980s. Um, so this, this gentleman here, John Solston, started studying these worms using a very simple microscope. And what John Solston did is he looked at the stages of cell division in C. elegans. So he looked at a two-cell embryo and then a four-cell and so on until, the, until this embryo looked like a little worm, and then he studied the, the, the embryo once it hatched. And he started making sketches of these worms. And so this is a sketch of John Solston's taken from his lab notebook in the 1980s. And so he would draw you know, these, each of these little circles as a cell. He would sort of denote the time at which the cell is divided. Uh, he would note the anterior and the posterior side of the animal. Uh, and he made, he made lots and lots of these uh, drawings from many thousands, tens of thousands of animals. And eventually his drawings got better and better, and he was able to sort of characterize at different embryonic stages where all the cells uh, were. Or at least he produced a few sketches of that. Uh, here, here are individual cells. These cells have names. And what Solston recognized was a, sort of a really curious thing. So in this worm, no matter which worm he looked at, the cells always divided the same way. So there were always the same number of cells, and the same cell always divided into the same other two cells. And so he was able to build a family, a tr a family tree, what we call a lineage, and he found that this lineage was invariant among animals. So this is the complete cell lineage of this little worm. And so it starts out from, from, two, sounder, from two founder cells, A, B, and P, 
and each of these divides into another two cells, and these cells divide into more cells, and so on and so forth. And it turns out we still use this lineage today, so I use it in my research. Now, he, he looked at these images of, of worms in a microscope, and what he found is that certain cells were destined to become nerve cells, certain cells became muscle cells or gut or skin, and the same cells always became this, these sublineages. And curiously, certain cells were programmed to die. So this is called apoptosis. He found that certain cells in C. elegans were programmed to die. Um, and, and it turns out that you know, this, this idea of programmed cell death in development is a generic idea. So it's true in us as well. You know, we're born with webs between our hands, and these webs eventually dissolve. And in fact, in general, in developmental biology, the idea of pruning back structures is kind of a generic concept, which is maybe a, a bizarre idea, right? We're used to thinking of cells becoming more and more cells as we grow up. But in fact, there's a good deal of cell death and pruning before we get the finished product. Um, so, you know, this, this, this program cell death is not just important in development. It turns out that it also is, is incredibly important in, in diseases. So when you don't have enough programmed cell death, you can get cancer. If, cell, if something goes wrong in your cells and they, aren't, they don't die like they should, they can multiply. That's a disease of too little apoptosis. On the other hand, if you have too much apoptosis, you can get neurodegeneration. And so what John Solston found in the worm, the, the, the phenomenon and the genes and the pathways he found were conserved all the way up to us. And for this, he got the Nobel Prize. Uh, it turns out that, um, depending on how you count, over the last 14 years, there have been between six or eight Nobel Prizes given in this worm for discoveries that were either, either made in the worm or used the worm in some way. And, of course, Solston's discovery started out very simply by studying uh, images of, of, a, of, of a C. elegans embryo in a microscope. So, so uh, you can find fundamental things about, about human biology inside model organisms. Um, so then, now let's go back to, to, the, to the worm brain. So to review, it has a very simple architecture. You know, it has a behaviors. It mates, it smells, it crawls around. If you touch it, it recoils. It even has a primitive memory, but all of this behavior is coded for by a very simple nervous system, only a few hundred neurons, a few thousand synapses. C. elegans uh, is also advantageous because you can tag each neuron specifically. So you can express a fluorescent dye in whatever neuron you want and actually look at it in a microscope. So this image over here is a, is a worm that is stretched out in a microscope, and here we're looking at a bunch of neurons and their processes extend along the length of the animal. So because it's so simple, you can ask questions about where the genes are expressed, how they direct wiring, where all the individual cells are. And you can ask very simple questions that actually today we still don't know the answer to. So we have a family tree of every cell, but nobody has been able to reproduce the drawings that Solston has done. And we certainly don't know volumetrically or in time where any neuron is at any particular time in the worm. So that's a very simple sort of concept in a, in a map of the animal, and we don't have it. So I think if you want to ask general principles about how all the neurons come together to form the brain, this is a good organism to start with. Okay, so more specifically, what I'd like to do is to follow all 222 neurons in the embryo and their cell outgrowths, their axons and their neurites. So here we're looking at, for, for, for example, a movie showing you a bunch of neurons and these particular neurons are forming the primitive brain. It's kind of a ring, it's called the nerve ring. So this is just a subset of all of the neurons in this embryo. I would like to know where all the neurons are. Um, because this embryo, because this worm is very stereotyped, you can look at thousands of animals and different subsets of neurons in each animal and then fuse all the data together in a digital atlas, uh, much like sort of Google Map, except in, 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 in a three dimensions and across time. And knowing where the cells are and where the outgrowths are is really just the beginning. So this is sort of a, what we imagine as a resource. And if you go to this website, wormguides.org, you can actually track our progress. So there is an app on that website you can download for your desktop or your phone, and you can sort of see how far we've gotten in this project. And this is only, um, you know, getting the neurons is the start. We would also like to know where all the proteins are in this dynamic worm as it grows up, and the activity of the worm, so the neurons firing. And, and before I go any further, I just want to acknowledge my collaborators. So this is really a project between my lab at the NIH and three other labs. There's a neuroscientist at Yale University, Daniel Colon Ramos. There's a developmental biologist at Sloan Kettering, Zhirong Bao, and a, and, a com and a developmental biologist at Connecticut, Bill Moeller. So, so this is kind of the project. Um, let, me, let me go into a bit more detail about why the worm embryo is such a good uh, system for this project. So one thing is it's transparent. This is a movie of a developing C. elegans embryo, and it was taken in a, with a microscope that you might find 
in a, in a high school or a middle school lab. Each of these little individual blobs here is one cell. And just using this simple microscope, you can sort of see morphologically how the animal changes from a two-cell uh, uh, embryo to this, uh, this thing that starts to look like a worm. And you can even see these things hatch after about 13 hours of filming in this, mov in this uh, movie. So the optical transparency is a big deal. Okay? We can't look through the entire fish or fly or mouse, certainly a human, without light scattering being a problem. But in the worm, we can look all the way through. So that's a huge advantage. But it actually gets even better than this because we can use kind of a simple microscope to look at the overall morphology of the animal. But we can also use uh, a fluorescence microscope to tag particular proteins within the animal. So in this particular movie, we're looking at the histones that label the DNA inside the animal. And what you can see here are a bunch of little blobs. These are the individual nuclei of all of the cells. And we can track how each nucleus develops within the animal. You can also track subsets of cells. So we can follow the, the sublineages, like the pharynx, the skin, the neuron, the muscle, the gut. I think the green, greenish cells you're seeing here will eventually become the pharyngeal cells. And because the development of the animal is stereotyped, we can take this one step further. We can, we can track the individual nuclear divisions, um, and we can follow what each cell will become, and we can, form, we can refer back to this lineage that John Sulston made in order to identify what each cell is. So the worm, C. elegans, remains the only animal for which we can, from the images, predict what each cell will become. That's a huge advantage because you can place each cell within its neighbors just by looking at a microscope. So um, I've talked about the transparency of the animal and I've talked about the, the lineage and the cells that you're looking at here in these movies. It turns out that this is also a great system for studying the nervous system. And there's an analogy, analogy to be made here between the, the wiring diagram of a circuit and the wiring diagram of an animal. So this is, this is a, a, an illustration I downloaded from the internet, but it turns out that my computer, of course, has lots of electronic circuits uh, in it as well, and there's a precise relationship between when I press a key to advance a slide and, and, this, and, and the output that you see on the computer, and this is carried out by software and hardware circuitry that is within the computer. Well, neuroscientists also think about circuits to describe brains. So, there, you know, there, there are functional parts here. There's an information flow. So, so too it is with the brain. Here is a neuronal wire, wiring diagram that was made over 100 years ago by one of the fathers of neuroscience. Uh, this, this particular diagram shows you uh, a structure of the mammalian rat, retina. So there are rods and cones at one end that transduce information coming in from the environment. Then there, there are intermediate layers of cells, neurons, and then there's an optic nerve. So like the electronic circuit, there is an informational flow, there is a direction to which the information flows, and there are functional parts that connect different parts of the nervous system. Uh, neuroscientists call this, this set of wiring diagrams the connectome. So you might have heard about the connectome, and getting the connectome of a human brain is one of the holy grails of neuroscience. It turns out that the worm is the only organism for which we have something that resembles a connectome. So another one of John Solston's contemporaries, John White, in the 80s, took a bunch of C. elegans worms, he, he killed them, he sliced them up real thin like salami, put each piece of salami under a very powerful microscope, an electron microscope, and was able to trace all of the connections between these neurons. So this is an example of one of the maps that he made. Um, it's just a two-dimensional map showing you all of the connections between the motor neurons that drive the movement of this worm. He actually did this for all 302 neurons in the animal. So this is a connectome, and this, this took him about 15 years. And, and this was done in the, uh, in the 80s, and it's still the only one we have. So to do this in the mouse or in the human is, we're talking about decades of work uh, and many, many more decades to just trace all of the connections. So this is what, this is the kind of complexity you get in a worm. But having this connectome is kind of like having a bit of a cheat sheet for the project that I described. So we know in a few dead adult worms what the end point looks like. What we don't know is how it got there, and that's the thing that I'm interested in, in, in determining. So I want to know how this living connectome emerges in the embryo. So I, I've talked about some of the advantages of the worm. What about the disadvantages, or what about the challenges? So one challenge is that the worm is pretty small, and the embryo is even smaller. So this is kind of a cross-sectional view of an embryo as it might appear on a, on a glass cover slip. It's about 50 microns long and 30 microns thick. A micron is a millionth of a meter. So these things are too small to be seen by the naked eye. You need a relatively high power microscope. They're, they're easily a million times smaller than us. And the resolution we want in order to visualize the neurons and the, 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 uh, the axons that emanate from these neurons is even a million times smaller. So the kind of voxel size 
is, is 100,000 times smaller than the embryo size. And the challenge for the microscopist is to carve this embryo up optically in a microscope without killing it over about 14 hours of development while imaging as fast as you need to to capture the neuronal growth after the muscles form. That's, that's not a trivial task. The, the kind of uh, micros microscope that is commonly available in a, in a college lab or in a high school lab is what's called a wide field microscope. And in a wide field microscope, it's, it's very fast. So you take a, a volume by just scanning an objective lens through the sample, imaging one plane at a time and recording onto a camera. The problem is that while you're doing that, that imaging, the light is going everywhere through the embryo. So you're imaging the embryo through its volume, but you're only recording one plane at once. And that's very inefficient because you get photo damage through the entire volume. And so you can do that for a few time points. But if you do that over many time points, you can easily torture your sample. So this is an example of a cell, not an embryo, just a cell that I put in a microscope and I was happily imaging it. And over maybe five to 10 minutes, the cell started crawling up. So this is a, this is a huge problem in microscopy. Um, this is just kind of a two-dimensional imaging series, but imagine now doing this in three dimensions and not for a few minutes, but for more than 10 hours, and now you start to see the problem. The embryos just div don't divide. They stop and they arrest. So in order to get around this problem, we make use of a very simple trick. Instead of making the light go all the way through the embryo, we just make it go through a thin sheet, a thin plane that we look at. So we take our illumination, we shape it into a light sheet, and illuminate one plane, and we look at that plane from the side. And then by sweeping the light sheet through the embryo at high speed and recording one image for each position of the light sheet, we can build up a volume. So that, that concept, it turns out, has been around for more than 100 years. Uh, we have kind of modernized it, and we call this microscope a selective plane illumination microscope, or a SPIM, just because we selectively illuminate one plane of the embryo at once. So this is sort of the overall concept. What does this microscope actually look like? So we've, we've built this concept onto an inverted microscope, and so we call this the I-SPIM, or the inverted microscope-based SPIM. Here are a couple of diagrams. So we, we kind of uh, put the C. elegans embryo on a glass cover slip, and over that embryo we have two objectives oriented at 90 degrees. One objective brings in the light sheet that kind of optically interrogates the, the embryo. The other objective looks at the fluorescence from that light sheet, and by scanning the light sheet and the detection objective in sync, we can build up a volume at high speed. So you know, it, it, took, us, um, it took us some time to think of this and, and to build it, and then we immediately started using it to interrogate C. elegans embryos. So I'm gonna show you a movie here of cellular division from the two cell stage now all the way through embryogenesis. So now you can see on this half of the movie here, there are four, there were four cells, now soon there'll be eight cells, and the time scale here is, is hours, minutes, and seconds. I've taken one embryo data set and in the interest of time kind of divided it in two. So in this, this is showing you the second half of, of embryogenesis um, after the muscles start to, to have formed and the whole animal starts to twitch. And even though the animal is moving fairly rapidly, we're imaging in general fast enough that we can catch each cell as it's moving around. And so after about 13 and a half hours of continuous imaging, um, what we find is that the embryo hatches on time 13 and a half hours after the onset of imaging. And that, that is routine. It always happens. There it goes. So now the embryo is hatched and it goes on to develop and make more, more embryos. Um, so just some numbers for you. There, every frame in this movie is a projection of a volume. And there are 25,000 volumes in this data set. So that's quite a lot of data, um, maybe on the order of 100 gigabytes of data that we've stored in our computer. And despite all of this imaging, the embryos always hatch on time. So there's no discernible effect of the light. So in, from, from that metric, this, this microscope is kind of an enabling tool. It also happens to be about 30 times faster than another microscope that you might use to study the worm. So it, it's both fast and it's gentle. Now what I'm, interested in is, what I'm interested in is not just the cell divisions. I want to know what, what is happening to all of the neurons. So I'm now going to show you another uh, set of movies showing you kind of the trajectory of a few neurons from when they are born to when the embryo hatches. So there are, there are about four, four or five neurons over here. The embryo is kind of, most of it is dark. It's kind of a circular uh, shape over here. And these neurons start out at one end of the embryo. Over the next hour or so, they crawl from the posterior end of the embryo to the anterior end over here. Um, about seven hours into embryogenesis, the muscles have formed and the embryo starts to move around. A little bit later, the animal starts to move even more. And then 
about nine hours into it, you can start to see that some of these cells have started to form axons. Um, so these two cells over here have axons, and the axons have what's called growth cones at the ends of the axons. So the, the neurons are actually sniffing out other neurons that you cannot see as they form the functional brain. Eventually, the axons get long enough to span the entire length of the animal. So you can kind of, in some of these frames, you can see these long processes, which are the axons. So the, the point of showing you this movie is just to say that these structures are dynamic. The way, the way in which they're born is not the way that they end up. They end up forming these long, complicated processes en in, en route to forming the brain. And I, what I'm after is tracking how all of these neurons change shape in order to build a composite model of brain development. So we can start to do that by looking at sparsely labeled cells in many different embryos, like in this embryo over here. Now, no microscope is perfect, and one problem with the images that I'm showing you over here is that the resolution in the axial dimension is quite a bit poorer than in the lateral dimension. So I've been showing you projections, and that's because if you look at the stack, the whole volume of the embryo at each time point, what you find is that the resolution in the plane of the imaging is much better than the resolution uh, along the optic axis. So if you take one of those volumes, those nuclear volumes, as it comes out of the microscope, life is pretty good, and you can distinguish these, these cells fairly easily. If you take that volume and rotate it 90 degrees, so that now, now, now you're looking at it from the perpendicular view, you see that these nuclei get distorted. And the reason they get distorted is due to fundamental physics. Any lens images the, the plane that the camera sees better than the plane along, the, along which the lens looks. So in the case of my light sheet microscope, that means that features in the plane of the light sheet are resolved to about two to three times better than, than, than uh, neurons, let's say, that are perpendicular to my light sheet. And that's really a problem because, because we would like to observe not just the cells, but also find processes within the cells. Now, one way of getting around this problem is just to look at the sample from two different directions. So let me explain what I mean by that. If I take this coffee cup and I look at it like this, I get a pretty good view of this, this side of the coffee cup, but I have almost no information about how, how deep it goes, how far deep it goes. But if I just take this coffee cup and rotate it, or if I look at it like this from 90 degrees, now I have a much better sense of the overall shape of the object. And the same is true microscopically. So if I take this image and just look at it from two perpendicular directions, now I can infer a lot more detail than if I just look at the object from one side. So it turns out that we can use that idea in the context of this developing worm embryo to get a much better image of the animal. So how do we actually do this? Well, we take our eye spim, our inverted microscope-based spim, and we just add a second camera. We already have two objective lenses that look at it from two perpendicular directions. So one objective brings in the light sheet. The other objective looks at that light sheet. We, we collect a volume. Then the second objective brings in the light sheet, and the first objective looks at that light sheet. And by fusing both of these two data sets together, using some mathematics, we can recover a data set with so-called isotropic resolution. So the neurons look equally good no matter how we look at the volume. And, and that, that turns out to be enabling. So I have a few examples for you. Um, here, here are, again, the nuclear divisions in this animal. And here you can see the nuclei as they appear from one side and then from the other side. And hopefully you can appreciate that certainly in this view, in this axial view, the nuclei are much, much sharper. So it's much easier to track the individual cells using this dual view system than the single view system. And we're, we're, we're only taking twice as many images. So the embryos all still hatch on time and we're not compromising the phototoxicity advantage of the microscope. So if we wait uh, here until the end of the movie, the embryos always uh, still hatch, there, there they go. Uh, the same thing holds true for neurons. So here are those, those five neurons again, and here, is the, here are the dual view images, here is the single view data set, and if you look at these neurons over here, particularly in this view, there are these fine processes, these growth cones that are just masked by diffraction in the single view imaging system. So if you want to trace the outline of each cell, this makes it much, much easier having this additional optical uh, path in which to look. So using this microscope, my, my colleagues um, at these other universities, they've built their own microscopes, and they've started to track which neurons form the, form the proto, prototypical brain in this animal. So they can, they can image the neurons in one color, here shown in green, and, and all of the nuclei in another color, here shown in red, and they can actually identify which neurons are the first ones, the pioneers that form this nerve ring, this brain. So it turns out that it's, it's thought that um, there are pioneer cells that lay down chemical cues for the other cells to, to kind of follow in order to, to join this nerve ring. 
And by, by imaging different subsets of neurons, they th they've narrowed it down to these eight neurons. And I have a, a movie over here just showing you the first events in nervous system assembly in this brain. So these two yellow neurons are the first ones, and you can start to see these other neurons cluster around them. And these gray cells are the, are the nuclei, which were used to identify the neurons by comparing the, the pattern of cell divisions to the, to the lineage diagram that I showed you that John Solston made in the 1980s. So, you know, this, this, this is kind of a glimpse of the initial formation of the brain, but one of the annoying things about this movie is that it ends. It ends just after the brain starts to connect, right? And the reason it ends is not a problem of the microscopy. It's because the worm itself pr pr um, presents this interesting uh, challenge after the muscles form, which I've already alluded to a little bit before, and that is the twitching of the animal. So the first seven and a half hours or so of embryogenesis are pretty easy to follow because the muscles haven't yet formed or they've, or they've just started to twitch. The last four or five hours are really a pain because the entire animal starts to swim in the eggshell. So here's a late stage embryo and my microscope is good enough to resolve individual cells and track them, but the frame of reference still keeps moving around. So it's a real pain to keep track of where these neurons are in this developing animal. It's a problem certainly if you look at just one animal, but it's even worse if you look at multiple animals, right? Because although the cell divisions are stereotyped, the twitching is pseudo-random. So these animals are all twitching independently and you have a four-dimensional alignment problem on your hands. So you, even if you image each animal carefully, if they all twitch differently, the positions are apparently uncorrelated. So you need a way of aligning these animals or de-twitching them so that you can make sense of this mass of data. The microscopy alone isn't enough. And so we have developed a computational method of unwrapping the embryo. So we do this post hoc in the computer. And the way we do this is that we make use of fiducial markers in the animal. So this is a, an example of a twisted up embryo. These green blobs are what's called seam cells that line the outside of the animal. And it turns out that by using those seam cells, we can model the twisted up embryo data set, model it well enough that we can resample it and untwist it. So I have a movie to kind of make, make more, uh, hopefully make, make that a little bit more intuitive. Here we can see a twisted up animal. And what the computer does is that it labels each of these blobs, these seam cells. It turns out that these seam cells are bilaterally symmetric. So we can pair them. We can pair left and right. And once we have that pairing, we can connect the seam cells along the sort of skeleton of the worm. We call that building the lattice. That's a very primitive model of the animal. But then we can refine the model. We can curve fit along the left and right sides of the animal and along the midline of the animal. Now you can hopefully start to see the overall shape of the animal taking place. Then we sweep a series of elliptical cross sections through this wireframe model. So to sort of generate a more three-dimensional model, uh, there you can sort of see, see that taking place. And then what we do is we just expand the model to make sure we capture all of the imaging data in this animal over here. There it goes. Once we have that model of the animal, we can then resample it by, by sweeping a series of cross sections along the length of the animal from the head to the tail. And what you can see here is the worm as it's being straightened in two different views, one sort of sighting down the barrel of the worm and one from the side. And what you can see now is that once we have this straightened worm, it's much easier to see where the cells are. So I can easily identify the head of the animal, the tail. This is the pharynx, which eventually the worm will use to eat bacteria. So this makes it much easier to assign where the cells are in this kind of linearized context. It also makes it easier to compare different animals from one animal to another. And so to skip over about a couple of years of work, I can use this untwisting process to now show you where a group of cells is in this elongating animal. So this is, these are two different views of the late stage worm. And each blob, each ball is a cell. And the sticks that you see here are a pair of neurites emerging from those cells. So this is a very simple uh, biophysical model that I made by looking at seven different animals after untwisting them. And then what I'm showing you here are the average cell positions. So this is uh, a very simple model, but I can already learn a few things. So one thing I learned is that these pair of neurites uh, migrates well after the cells assume their final position. So there's something in the genetic code that is, pro that it, uh, there's a program that is telling those neurites to keep going well after the cells assume their final position. That's a fact that was just very difficult to observe in the twisted up animal. Another, another thing that you, you, you see if you look very carefully is that these two neurons are, asymmet are asymmetric. So there's a left and a right pair, but, the, but, the, but one side always migrates at a faster rate than the other. And we don't know why, but now we know that they do. So this, these kinds of models can, can inform hypotheses now. And you know, they were taken by microscopes and then untwisted using this, com this computer program.
Um, we have a lot more work to do, so this is just 25 cells. There are 550 in the embryo. So a lot of my work over the next five years is gonna be filling in as much of this data as I can. So we think we can get there. Here, here's just sort of a proof of concept showing you that we can track all of the nuclei on, in this untwisted animal. And once we have the kind of ball and stick positions of all of the cells, we then want to segment the data so we can understand how the neuronal morphology all fits together. So the, the images uh, taken in these microscopes are much richer than the ball and stick model. There actually quite, there's quite a bit of information in the shape of these, of these structures here, these growth cones in, at the end of the animal. And so that, that is one more level of complexity that we hope to, hope to build in to this model of the developing animal. So I've, I've spent uh, some time telling you about the structure of the, of the animal, uh, in the, of the developing animal. And there's an analogy to be made here uh, to sort of Google Maps. So here is a map of Los Angeles, which might be useful if you want to plan a route um, or if you want to know what the street names are. But oftentimes when you look at a map like this, you want to know more than this. You might want to know something about the activity, right, or the traffic. So you might want to know which streets are congested, where, you know, where, where not to go. And there's an analogy here also back to the nervous system. So in addition to just where the neurons are and how they're connected, if you want to understand behavior, you also want to know which neuron is talking to which other neuron. And that is largely, uh, sort of largely not known. Um, certainly it's not known uh, in us, but it's even not known at the level of cells in the worm. So one of the, so more questions that we're starting to ask now that we start to have a sense of where these neurons are is, if, is to ask the question if we can map electri electrical activity in the embryo. So can we correlate one neuron to another, and can we, just, can, we, can we start to understand when the nervous system sort of goes online? That's a question that nobody knows the answer to, even in the worm. And that dovetails nicely with the structural map that I started telling you about. So it turns out that um, if you want to map activity, you have to use a proxy for the neuronal activity. Uh, in us and in worms, uh, the activity is electrical. So you can, if you can map calcium or other ions, then you have a proxy for information flow in the nervous system. And just like we can map structure by, by painting it with a fluorescent dye, we can also map activity with painting, by painting uh, calcium with a sensor. And so this is an example of calcium activity in muscles. In this particular uh, stage of embryogenesis, there are four bands of muscle that run down the animal. So you can sort of see, see over here, one, two, three, four. And what you can see here is that certain bands of muscle get brighter and dimmer. Those are calcium waves that are propagating through the animal as it is behaving, as it is moving around. So you can take um, a structure like this and you can actually analyze it in a bit more detail. So if you take one of those volumes, you can look down the center of that volume. Here I've bisected it with a green line. So imagine the plane going into and out of the page. That's this cross-sectional view that I've shown over here. And using this cross-sectional view, you can label each muscle quadrant and actually see how that quadrant moves, how it rotates. So this is a very primitive behavior. The worm is just learning to move and it's kind of rotating within the eggshell in this twofold stage. You can actually define an angle of rotation by looking at those four quadrants and you can plot that angle. So here I'm, I'm showing you here as the, as the worm is moving what it's doing. First it rotates one way, it might rotate back the other way and then rotate forwards again. So we're just plotting the angle of rotation versus time. And if you look at each of these muscle bands that I've sort of I've labeled here in each of these colors, you can correlate the activity in each muscle to the way in which the animal is moving. So this is an activity map for the muscle. And what you can start to see here is that as the animal rotates one way, there's an accompanying pulse of activity in two of these muscles. As it rotates back the other way, there's a, there's a correlation in the other bands of muscles. So these muscles are working antagonistically to drive the embryo backwards and forwards. This is, a, this is the first time we've been able to look at the actual activity flux within the animal. Um, you also start to see that these two quadrants, the, the red and the orange quadrants here, are, are correlated. Uh, so whenever you see a pulse here, you also see a pulse in this lower quadrant. Similarly, the dorsal side are also correlated. So these are the kinds of things one can learn by looking at the flux of, uh, it, within the muscle of this animal. Now, one outstanding question is when the nervous system starts to influence the muscles. So when does the animal actually start to control its movement? And that's another question that we don't have the answer to. In order to answer that, you want to record from all of the neurons at once. So we can, we can start to do that also in this animal. This is an example now of near brain-wide activity mapping or seeing the activity of in, in, in individual neurons in this, uh, in this late C. elegans embryo. So these bright blobs over here are not, not so interesting. They're just an, a co-injection marker that we use for marking the animal. 
but each of these little blobs over here is a neuron, is a neuronal nucleus. And hopefully what you can see here is as this movie plays, certain neurons flicker. And that, the, the flickering there is the neuron actually, in some sense, thinking. So you're looking at the first thoughts of an animal. Now, what it's thinking, I couldn't tell you. But in principle, all of these neurons have a name. And what we're interested in doing now is naming them and seeing which neurons start to fire first and which ones fire together. So we can, we, we're just starting to do that. All of this, this data that I'm showing you is unpublished. But here is a segmentation or a track of all of these neurons where I've color-coded the neurons by their activity. So the, the ones that are really red are very active. The ones that are more blue are less active. And you can start to see by looking at this activity map here that this particular neuron is super active. These guys here are active sort of at the end of the imaging here. All of this blue here are neurons for which we haven't yet been able to extract their activity. So this is an example of, of, a, of a brain activity map for this particular time in, in, in C. elegans embryogenesis. And we have a lot of work now as far as filling in the activity for all of the neurons throughout, throughout development, but that's sort of where we're heading next. And, and again, the power of this embryo is that in theory, you can get all of the structure, you could label all of the neurons and then ask also what they're all doing. That's something that we just can't do yet in a mouse or a fish or a fly or, or us. Um, even though we're not quite at the point where I can tell you what all of these neurons are doing at every point in development, we're getting close to the, to the ability at looking at what particular neurons are doing. So I have one last example for you. So I'm going I'm to play a movie of a late-stage embryo with expression of this activity sensor in just eight neurons. And what you'll see is that every time the embryo moves backwards, there, are, there is a pulse of activity in these cells. So now I'm going to play the movie so you can see some twitching here these bright blobs of the neurons, and every time the, the, the worm moves back, there's a pulse of activity. The reason that's interesting is that these particular neurons are known to control backwards movement in the, in the adult. That's why we picked this strain. And here we have the first direct proof that in the embryo as well, the nervous system is wired. So by this point, presumably, the embryo has learned to move backwards. This is just one example. We'd like to know also like, when the embryo can start to sense temperature, when it can start to smell. And by doing this kind of imaging, we can now get at that problem. So I've, I've, I've given you kind of a glimpse as to what's possible in this simple animal, this worm. And we have a lot of work ahead of us. We want to know what, where all the neurons are, how their shapes change, when they start to connect with other neurons and integrate that into this atlas. We, I haven't said anything about the proteins, right? I've just been talking about individual cells. But of course, there are, there are biochemicals that tell the neurons where to go. And adding that complexity, is, is, is that's another layer of complexity into this map. I've given you a sense as to the activity and how that, can, you know, how, how that correlates with the behavior. And of course, the underlying question, which, which will take a lot more work, is how all, of, how all of this translates all the way up to the food chain to us. So the, these are all specific things that I'm going to work on in the next, uh, in the next phase of my research. Um, I'd like to sort of end on just a philosophical point. Um, one of my favorite authors is, is, is the Arge Argentinian author, uh, Jorge Luis Borges, and he has this one paragraph short story. Um, it's about a, a fanciful nation of cartographers. And these cartographers started to make maps. They started to make very detailed maps, but eventually made the, they made their maps so detailed that they were unusable. So they talk about how the Cartographers Guild struck a map of the empire that coincided point by point for the actual land mass itself, and that their descendants found that this was largely useless. So one, one problem when you make maps, and one problem is neuroscience, is knowing how much detail is enough. The, the, the whole point of, uh, of my research and of neuroscience in general is to try and extract general principles about how brains work. One of the key challenges in microscopy and in neuroscience is that with better information tools, you can, you can image and analyze a whole hell of a lot, and knowing how much information is valuable is a really difficult challenge. And hopefully, by studying very simple model organisms like this worm, we can start to chip away at that problem. So let me end now by thanking the, uh, the NIH by giving me a job. Um, I've tried to thank my collaborators along the way, Danielle at Yale, Jerome Bao, Bill Moeller, and their staff. Um, I collaborate with companies sometimes, so I collaborated with a small company in Eugene to make the microscope I showed you today. Um, all of the work that I showed you in my lab was done by just four postdocs. So um, Ichong Wu and Abhishek Kumar built the microscopes in my lab. Uh, Ryan Christensen and Ichong Wu wrote the untwisting program for un unwrapping the worms in the late stage. Uh, Evan Ardeal and, 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 uh, and Abhishek Kumar did the brain activity mapping that I told you about today. Uh, much of the work that I showed you about was done at the NIH and in the NIBIB. Uh, some of it was also done in the summers at Woods Hole. 
Uh, I'd like to thank the Grass Foundation for uh, supporting my postdocs, and of course the National Academies and the Calvi Foundation for bringing me here. So thank you very much for your attention.